Before we begin this morning, let's go to our Heavenly Father in the word of prayer. Blake, if you would, direct your minds to that prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this time that we have to come together with fellow Christians and study your word. Thank you for uh, the blessing of your word that we have uh, that we can hold in our hands and study from it. Uh, pray that you will help us to be able to learn things uh, as we're going through this study, that we'll be able to apply them to our lives. We can encourage one another and be uh, better servants for you. Pray that you will help us uh, to encourage and admonish one another uh, when appropriate. Pray that you will watch over us uh, through this study and on through the rest of our lives. Uh, forgive us of our sins when we do fall short. And we thank you for Jesus and uh, the hope of eternal life we have through him. Pray all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the lesson we're going to be considering today, lesson number seven, is a le- first of two parts that will now look at some of the blessed R statements from the Sermon on the Mount. What was interesting is not long after we began this particular study, we drove by uh, some church over on 2nd Street and they had a red marquee, a digital marquee out there, and they were advertising a blessed R study. And I about called them copycats until I saw the fine print and it was simply a study of the Sermon on the Mount. But with this study, we've gone beyond that to look at a number of passages that uses the phrase blessed are, and we see what context that is and and how how we are blessed when we we fit the context there. And so lesson number seven and lesson number eight will be looking at the statements in the Sermon on the Mount. Lesson number nine will kind of follow up with that with blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. And then we'll have about a couple more lessons that will follow after that. Um, And my, my goal was to try to get through these lessons within this course of within the first portion of our study that will end probably a little bit before Christmas, you know, kind of getting it through there. And so we'll see that and then we'll have a different study for the springtime. So let's go ahead and begin this morning as we look at this. Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Matthew or as I have so put it in the outline, Math through. <laughs> This was kind of not proofed very well, and it was my fault. (laughs) Okay. Now, I tell you what, let's go ahead and do. Let's go ahead for the sake of continuity. Let's go ahead and read from the Sermon on the Mount, beginning of Matthew chapter 5. And let's read down through verse 11, uh, just so that we can be reminded of the context here of that. And let's see, Rod, if you would read for us verses 5 and 2. <laughs> or 2 and 3. Okay. We'll see how the day goes. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right. Miss Pat, verses, uh, fi- uh, Pat McBride, verses 5, five 4 and 5. Blessed are, oh, this fire. blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. All right, Miss Karen, let's read uh, verses 6 and 7, please. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. All right, and Miss Phyllis, 8 and 9. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. All right, and let's see. Miss Betty, do you want to read? Yes. Okay, uh, would you read for us verses 10 and 11? Blessed are those who persecute, are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Bless, blessed are you when you revile and persecute, and you say all kinds of evil things against you fall asleep for my sake. All righty. Thank you, Miss Betty. So let's step back then to verse 3. Now, you, we kind of have to ask ourselves, is there an intended continuity within the thought process of what Jesus is saying? Or are these just seemingly random 
and unconnected statements. And I really believe as you look through this and think about it, you're going to see a continuity here within the statements there. And essentially, all of them are describing a particular type of individual. And what's going to be very important with this study as we go through this is there's going to be a contrast, a comparison that is going to be drawn between one, one type of individual and then another type of individual. They are opposites of one another. And we'll see this from the very beginning as we start this out. We'll kind of see this develop as we go along. So let's start here in verse 3. He begins by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, notice the phrase there, blessed are the poor in spirit. Let me bring up a definition for you. I, I have this in the outline, but I'm going to bring it up on the screen so you can see it. The idea of being poor. And we're going to show Thayer's definition up here. And um, hang on just a moment. It will be very similar to what we have here within the outline. I pulled it from a little bit different source, but this will work. Notice he says here that poor is the idea of reduced to beggary, begging or asking of alms. But then the second definition, destitute of wealth, influence, position, and honor. And then let's add to that a little bit. He says, lowly, afflicted, destitute of the Christian virtues and eternal riches. Now, he begins to expand a little bit in the application of it. But I want you to notice there that the concept or the idea that we're looking at here, when you look at the term poor, it is, taking it more literally, the aspect of one crouching, one that is in such a destitute position that they are effectively doing what? effectively begging that type of poverty uh, not the poverty where we think that well we don't have as much money as everybody else not even the type of poverty where we're surviving by living in a cardboard box and we still have food we're talking about someone that is completely destitute without anything and effectively without hope and so you'll see there in the outline that we have the pictures painted of one who is poverty stricken and cowers down out of shame Spiritually speaking, it would describe an individual who is lost in what? Lost in sin. Yeah, their soul is lost. They are spiritually destitute. They are separated from God. Now, this is very important to, to kind of let this sink in a little bit, that this is where he is beginning from, an individual who is completely separated from God, who is spiritually destitute, in all things. Now, think about this for just a moment and notice there we're going to look at a reference over in Revelation. Let's do a quick comparison, Revelation chapter 3, and let's look at the church here in Laodicea. Revelation 3 verse 17. They said about themselves, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And what does Jesus say? He says, do you not know that you are what? Wretched, yeah, wretched, miserable, poor, miserable, blind, and, poor, naked. blind, and naked. Exactly, yeah. They thought they were rich because they had monetary things. But the things that mattered the most is what they were lacking. Okay, is what they were lacking. Whereas if you turn the coin over and you look at the church in Smyrna, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, you see something a little bit different here. He says, I know your works. <laughs> tribulation and poverty, but you are what? Rich. Now here they were physically poverty stricken, okay? They, they, they were suffering greatly, but the reality is from a spiritual standpoint, they were rich, okay? And so when we stop and we think about what Jesus is saying here, and we'll pause for any questions or comments, when we stop and think about what Jesus is saying here, what we find, let's see if I can get my typing, there we go. What we find here, blessed are the poor in spirit. All right, what happens when you finally realize that you are at the, 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 the greatest point of poverty physically? What would you do? 
you would work beg, to change it. <laughs> yeah, you work to change it, but then you would beg for help, beg for any opportunity to work, do anything possible to change that. Well, those who are poor in spirit finally recognize their need for God. And it's not just saying, well, I'm not as good as I should be. It is, I am completely without, and so I need Him. And so why is the one who is poor blessed? Why? Because what is waiting for them? He says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, let's see, let's go ahead and jump ahead in the outline for just a moment. Look with me in Mark chapter 2. The kingdom of heaven was not prepared for those who were already righteous, if you would. The kingdom of heaven was prepared for those who were in need. And which is all mankind, obviously. But you had a group of people who thought that they weren't in need, that they were already righteous. Jesus says in talking to the Pharisees here in Mark 2, verse 16, they question as to why Jesus was eating and drinking with the tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are what? Yeah, he says, I did not come to call the righteous, but who to repentance? Yeah, that's who Jesus came to call. He didn't come for the spiritually wealthy. There were no one, there was no spiritually wealthy, I guess, if you would. He came for those who were spiritually impoverished, impoverished, those who were sick, those who were in need, those who are willing to recognize that the treasures in heaven are far more important than the treasures here upon this earth. Let's notice in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. We'll just take a glance at this. But he says there, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. In heaven. So now the one who is poor in spirit can now enter into the kingdom of heaven and have this spiritual wealth. Any thoughts or any comments? That's kind of a hard, a hard place to find an individual, to find yourself in. You know, to finally recognize that's where you're at. But going back to this time period, we're, we're looking at a contrast here, and we're going to kind of build on this here a little bit here, although my artistic ability um, greatly lacking at the point of my creation. Um, my artistic ability. You might say on one side, we have the Pharisees. And the other side, we have, um, we're just going to put disciple of Christ in short. We're talking about those who are willing to listen to him. So we have a contrast between one who is, who is self-righteous, one who is wicked, one who's unwilling to listen and follow, and one who is in recognition of their need. All right, any thoughts or any comments? Miss uh, Phyllis and then Travis. This kind of sounds like, I, I don't know for sure, but those 12-step programs where the first step is to admit you have a problem. Right. If you don't, if you don't acknowledge or if you don't see it, you're never going to fix anything. That's right. That's exactly right. There's got to be the recognition of the need before we can go any farther. Travis. Well, that's, I, um, I used to look at it as, and I don't think it was quite the same way, as weak spiritual, weak in spirit. Not quite the same as we might pray for someone that's going away, I guess, you know, as far as you, you have to go, you have to strengthen yourself before you're going to be, you know, the weak spiritually will not necessarily... If you stay there, I guess mm -hmm. is what I'm saying, yeah. um, will not inherit the kingdom, but those who will strengthen themselves from that low point, I guess. And to come from that. Yeah. Yeah. And willing to turn to the one who can strengthen them. Yeah. Because when I would read this, I would think the poor in spirit, well, we pray about people. This is when I was mm -hmm. younger. We pray about people that are weak spiritually. How is yeah. this? How is this? They're the ones that are going to inherit the kingdom. But you see what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, I can see. Now I see it's from a different point. Yeah. You know, as he's talking about. Yeah. 
And what's interesting is even when we get to the meek, meek doesn't mean weak. Yeah. Yeah. But but yeah, and I th- I think probably this is this would probably be the way the direction to kind of a- approach it. There. Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments, Gene? The scriptures also describe spirit as life. Yeah, literally, it's the breath of life. Yeah. It depends on how you think, it, look at it. Yeah, that's true. Any other thoughts? All right, one other uh, passage before we we head on from this. In Revelation 2.10, he reminds them, he says, Be thou faithful unto death, and they would receive what? Crown of life. Yeah, crown of life. Paul references a crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4.8. Now, understand that a crown oftentimes symbolizes victory. All right, so if we are faithful even unto death, we'll have victory. We'll have that crown. But we can think of crown as far as the treasures go as well. Well, our treasures will be laid up in heaven and we will be blessed. And so the one who is poor in spirit, they're the ones who's gonna enter into the kingdom of heaven because they come to Christ and they turn to him in their impoverished state and they find the entrance therein. Any thoughts, any comments? Well, and this also just, I know we'll probably talk about this a lot, but the crowd, it, it works with this crowd who he's talking to. If he was standing in this, you know, the synagogue or some, you know, big open place where all the Pharisees and the scribes and the learned, this would not have been something that they would have received. Right. You know, I was thinking about when they, when Jesus healed the blind man in John chapter 9, and he was telling them about Jesus, and they were like, you would teach us about this? You were born in sin. You know, they were so haughty that they wouldn't have received this. Like, what do you mean poor in spirit? We're, that's right. Know, that's not us. We can't be that. Exactly. I think it's a good comparison there. Yeah. Good comparison. All right. Let's continue now. It's good points. Now, notice the next one. Those who mourn, as we find there in verse 4. He says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, if we take this by itself, we think about the person who cries a lot. Or we might think of um, Solomon's statement in the book of Ecclesiastes, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of rejoicing. And I think that's right. Yeah. And in showing there a contrast, that there are times it's better to mourn than to rejoice. But if we keep this as one continuous thought being built, then why would this person in verse 4 be mourning? If we think about what we just considered in verse 3. Separation from God. Okay. That may be the way to look at this. We've already talked about the one who is spiritually impoverished. Blessed are them. They're the ones that will enter the kingdom of heaven because they beg for what they need. That same individual is brought to this point of conversion because of their sorrow, because they're sorry for what they have done. They are filled with sorrow over the sin. If we turn over to Psalms chapter 51, verse 7, we kind of see an, an instance of this type of attitude. Psalms 51, verse 17. What does he say here are the sacrifices of God? He says a broken spirit Mm -hmm. and a contrite heart. Now, this is talking about the mourning that is done as a result of sin. And not the good mourning that we say when we wake up, but the mourning process Mourning over something, in this case, over sin. So the individual who's finally really willing to recognize that they are separated from God, that they're spiritually impoverished, will be sorrowful because of their lost condition and will, as a result, then turn back to the Lord. Any thoughts or comments about this? Consider, if you would, in Isaiah 61. The context here is a little bit different. He's talking kind of about the remnants. But over in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, observe there that he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord in the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. There, were a, there was a certain group of Israelites that mourned over their wickedness. Not all of them did. But the remnant would mourn over the wickedness and God would restore them. Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4 very similarly says, And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads. Notice this now. Put a mark on the foreheads of the men who do what? Sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within. So the concept of mourning here is really different than the concept of mourning that, that Solomon addresses when he says, Behold, it is better to dwell in the house of mourning than the house of joy. There's times for that. This mourning is different. This is the mourning where we're mourning over the sin that is within our life. We're mourning over the separation that we experience the separation that we have from God because of sin. Now again, keep in mind to whom Jesus was saying these things. He wasn't speaking to a whole group of thousands of those who are already converted to him. This was at the very beginning of his ministry in laying the foundation of those who would truly be blessed. Any thoughts or comments? All right, one question. What example in the New Testament do we have that conveys truly this type of, we might say, godly sorrow? Don't look at your outlines, though. If you do, it'll tell you. <laughs> Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. The church in Corinth. Paul had rebuked them because of their sin, because of what they had allowed to go on within that congregation. And as a result, it produced within them, he says, a godly sorrow. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. He says, but the sorrow of the world brings death. So then he says in verse 11, for observe this very thing that you sorrowed in what type of manner? Through a godly manner. And observe what it produced within them, a diligence, a clearing of themselves, a indignation, a fear, a vehement desire, zealousness, vindication. They proved themselves to be clear, all because they were sorrowful. They mourned when they learned that they were separated from God because of their sin. All right, any thoughts or any comments? Let's go back to Matthew. Any, any thoughts? Okay. Let's now look at verse 5. Here he says in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now this is an interesting statement that's been used and put on plaques all through history. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. There's an Old Testament passage that makes the same statement. So we're going to jump back to that passage and see if it might offer a little bit of help in kind of understanding maybe the direction where Christ, the direction Christ was going in. So we're going to go to Psalms chapter 37. Oh, we passed the morning part already. <laughs> All right, I can't type properly. Psalms chapter 37, verse 10. Now, there is a context to this statement, so I want to back up just a little bit. Well, let's go back to the very first verse, and we'll take time to read this here. Let's start with this. Um, Travis, if you would, read for us verses 1 and 2 of Psalms chapter 37. The Psalm of David. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. All right, Dale, 3 and 4, please. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. 
All right, Blake, uh, verses 5 and 6. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. All right, and then uh, Miss Janie, let's read thirty-seven or verses 7 and verse 8. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes. schemes Sorry. To pass. Now verse 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. All right, and uh, let's see. Miss Pat, let's read verses 9 and 10, please. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. All right, and Sister Decker, let's read. Uh, oh, go ahead and read one more verse, Miss Pat. <clears throat> For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. Okay, and then verses 11 and 12, Sister Decker. For the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just, and gnashes at them with his teeth. All righty, let's go ahead and stop there. He, he continues on, and ultimately as he goes on through this passage, we find here that what happens to the wicked? Exactly, exactly. The, the, the ones that the followers of God may worry about. Because the, the wicked always seem to abound. I mean, they always get what they want. At least it appears that way. And no one's able to stop them. Psalm 73, the Psalm of Asaph, a very similar type of worry that it appeared that the wicked were going to get away with everything that they were doing. But what he says here in verse 11, uh, well, let's see, let's go back to verses... Um, or was that other one? Maybe seven. verse 11. What did you say? Was it 7 where it says, do not fret? Well, that w well <laughs> sure, that works. Um, <laughs> he says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. The schemes of the wicked man, because of the, the, the man who brings wicked schemes to pass, don't worry about that. And here's why, verse 11 there. He says, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Now, what we see here is a contrast, and this goes back to what we are talking about a while ago with the two different uh, types of people here seen within the text. What's the opposite of the wicked as painted for us here? Yeah, the, the, the meek. And so when we think about the difference there, we then can understand better the meek. He's not talking about the timid person who hides in the corner and doesn't defend his property. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the opposite of the wicked. The wicked openly lives in defiance against God, and they go about doing everything that they would have to do in order to be able to get what they want. The meek, on the other hand, is willing to submit themselves unto God. You think about the wicked, could we say the wicked is arrogant and the wicked is self, well, not really self-righteous, but selfish? Whereas the meek, on the other hand, in this case of point, is the opposite of the wicked. And so whatever you look at, whatever is defined as wicked, the meek is completely opposite. One does not rely upon God, one rejects God altogether. The other one completely relies upon God, completely accepts the Lord. So it may be here then, and what we're looking at in the context, going back now to what Jesus is saying when he says, blessed are the meek. Let me turn back there. When he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, it may be again that contrast. The one who is sorrowful because of their sin, their separation from God, the one who is completely impoverished recognizing their spiritual poverty, they're willing to humble themselves before the Lord. Not rise up in arrogance against the Lord, but to humbly submit unto Him. The wicked does not, and the wicked claims to possess the earth, but really, it's the meek who shall receive the inheritance. Make sense? Kind of a way of looking at that. Um, any thoughts or any comments? Let's bring up real quick, and I don't think... Um, go ahead, Blake. Um, well, it's, I think of, uh, you know, meekness is, um, you know, not wanting to 
to like fight or quarrel or argue about something. And I also think of like physically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like if you have like a little guy picking on a big guy because he seems to be kind of a shy person. Um, you know, if he has meekness, he's not going to squash the little guy, even though he could. Right. Um, and so I almost think of like the vengeance is mine, I will repay. It's the idea that you know, being righteous and doing what you're supposed to do means that other people are going to be wicked, and they might appear to be getting all the good stuff, appear to be getting you know the praise of man or whatever. Um, but maintaining meekness means that ultimately you will inherit your reward that's been laid up for you. Yeah, that's a good point, and especially in when standing in opposition to the wicked. You know, we won't fret about them. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, what I brought up there was the definition. It doesn't help a whole lot because really the context goes a long way to help and define it. But it's the idea of mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit, meekness. Same statement, same word used in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, and talking about the disposition of the wives you know, within their homes there. Any thoughts? I thought Christ, um, when he emptied himself mm -hmm. and came to earth, was... The example of that. That's true, and, and humbling himself. Uh, any other thoughts? The one thing, like I said, coming back to the context, if we try to find a continuity here with what Jesus is saying, then it may fit with the the meek or the ones who, instead of inflating themselves against God, completely humble themselves before the Lord. That that might be in the continuity of poor those who mourn, those who are meek. And then it kind of leads then to the next one, what we'll look at there in verse six. Any thoughts, any comments? All right, let's see. I did not put the separation here before hunger and thirst, so I'll do that on the update. But now let's talk about those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Looking there at verse six there. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. <laughs> He says, they shall be what? Filled. Filled. All right, if we're following with this continuity here, we've gone from someone who is spiritually impoverished, impoverished and filled with sorrow as a result of their state. That individual being willing to humble themselves before the Lord, they must have a great desire for all things related unto God. Now, specifically here, he uses the term, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Now, the idea of hunger here, and let's go ahead and bring this up on the screen as well. This is not the 11 o'clock or 11.30 hungry because you know that lunch is almost around the corner and your no-protein breakfast gave out on you an hour ago. That's not the hunger he's talking about here. All right? He says here in the definition given, to hunger, to be hungry, to suffer want, to be needy. So let's think about that for just a moment. We have an individual who was spiritually impoverished. If that's the case, then what does he say they need to crave? Righteousness. Righteousness, exactly. Thirst is the same thing. I mean, this isn't the, 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 the little bitty thirst where um, you, know, you want to go and quench your thirst real quick. This is to suffer thirst, to suffer from thirst. So we're talking about an intense longing, an overwhelming desire, well, not even an overwhelming desire, a, needed, a needful desire, if you would, for something. And so in defining this, he says, blessed are those who hunger, who thirst for righteousness. All right, any thoughts or comments about that? Now, to me, here's the challenge. You know, each of these statements have an interesting challenge. For instance, you know, what does he mean by poor? What does he mean by mourn? And what does he mean by meek? You know, how, how can we connect a continuous flow there? Here, hunger and thirsting seems to be easy to understand. When you think about someone who is on death's door due to hunger, the craving that they would have within their eyes for that you know, turkey sitting on the table there that you're about to eat and everything. To me, the challenge is now asking the question, what is righteousness talking about here? Righteousness. What is it that they are to be longing for? 
We're going to talk about that in just a moment, but any thoughts or comments about it? Relationship, relationship with God is righteousness. Okay. Being right with. All right. Think about that for a moment. Let's go ahead and get rid of this illustration. It really didn't pan out the way I wanted it to. Can't blame it. I'm going to drew it, though. You think about the term righteousness. Pat, you, you made a good statement there when you said right. Okay, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go back to bed. I'm going to wake up and take my vitamins, which I failed to do this morning. That's probably the problem right there. Right with whom? God. Okay, right with God. <clears throat> if we understand the various statements that we looked at earlier, the one who is poor in spirit was separated from God. The recognition of that state, the sorrow of that state, brings them to the Lord. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, if we follow this through, then the end, that same individual is hungering and thirsting to be right with God. It's the overwhelming desire within them to be right with God, to have this righteousness, a complete opposite of where they once were. Any thoughts? Let's look at a, a couple verses here real quick. And you'll see these in the outline there. Let's look at the contrary, that which is contrary to righteousness by looking at James chapter 1, verse 21, and what James told them to put away there. Notice there he says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of what? Of weakness. Now, this is interesting here. Um, let's kind of an illustration here for just a moment. How many of y'all drink coffee in the morning? All right, you drink coffee, all right? How many people drink old oh, orange juice after you drink coffee? Okay. Any other juices? Coffee drinkers? Do you drink juices when you eat breakfast? Milk, maybe? Tea. Green tea. <laughs> It's not the same, but we'll work with it. Yeah. I, I, I use myself as an example. Okay. All right. I'll drink coffee in the morning. And then whenever I'm ready to eat breakfast, I'll go ahead and drink a glass of milk when I eat breakfast. But typically, I rinse out my coffee cup. Now, I've often thought about that. Well, I'll just not rinse it out, pour the milk on top of it. But I really don't want the milk to be flavored like coffee. You know, you're supposed to flavor your coffee with a little bit of milk, but not flavor your milk with a little bit of coffee. And so you rinse the cup out completely. You rinse it out. All right. Um, and if I was really particular, I'd, I'd put in the sink of, of, of soap and wash it out real quick. Because we don't want anything flavoring. We don't want anything that was in there to remain in there when we pour the new drink in it. That's why orange juice would have worked better in the illustration there, obviously. Well, notice here. He says, therefore, lay aside... You can't hang on to filthiness and, and, and an overindulgence in wickedness or the overflowing of wickedness. You have to get rid of them. There's not enough room inside for both the wickedness and the filthiness. There's not enough room inside us for that and the implanted Word of God. Like Sunday's lesson, you know, he's talking to the Pharisees and, and he says, you've not received my Word because my Word, has, my word finds no room in you. They were filled with anything else but what they needed to hear. And so the idea here is we've got to lay aside that which is contrary to God. And then, as he says here, receive for our study, crave, long for the implanted word of God. Uh, any thoughts? It would seem he's not talking so much about space, but rather dilution. If you, if you add milk to coffee, you dilute the product. So That's you true. Have, you don't have pure milk or pure coffee. And, and he's talking about don't do any, don't add anything that's going to dilute the truth, the, 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 uh, truth of God. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, better illustration, you are a black coffee drinker and you drunk milk first. You got to rinse the milk out of the cup, right? Because you don't have black coffee if you don't. Okay. Gene gave me the idea, so I thought I'd try it out there. Um, let's turn over to Mark chapter 7 and kind of get an idea of where this wickedness comes from. Mark chapter 7. And let's look at verses 20 and 21. Where does this wicked, or from where does this wickedness come? 
And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, <clears throat> wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. So the wickedness that we're talking about, where does it come from? Within. So if we are going to hunger and thirst for righteousness, we must then be willing to put aside all wickedness. We've had wickedness before. That's what resulted in our spiritual poverty. And we are sorrowful because of that. So let's humble ourselves before the Lord and desire to be right with God. Um, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul makes the point there that um, the wrath of God is against all who engage in wickedness, all manner of wickedness, all who are ungodly. Any thoughts? Hmm, can I make a, a statement on that? Sure. Um, mm -hmm. All of that that's up there doesn't have to be in your life for you to want to be right with God. <laughs> but I know the scripture says that, but it, it, you don't have to feel like that's all in your life to desire to be right with God. Right. You're, I mean, you're correct in that. Yeah. Uh, this is just for them, the very things that these people, the Pharisees, if you would, the very thing the Pharisees were yammering against and condemning everybody else for, they themselves were guilty of, whether physically or, or, or mentally. You know, they were just as wicked. They were more, even more wicked in some ways. I think that's some people's problem. If that's not in their life, then they think they're right with God. Yeah, well, at you least know, I don't do that. that there, there's a big difference. You can tell a big difference when you really are right with God and you're devouring his word. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It's exactly. All right. Uh, Travis. Um, I was in Mark chapter 7 earlier, but I thought that's maybe where you're going to go. A few verses down, um, it, it gives an account of this. It, Mark calls it a Syrophoenician woman, but mm -hmm. Matthew, I like the parallel account with Matthew. It says Canaanite woman in Matthew 15. And this is talking about not necessarily righteousness, but a hunger for salvation. If you remember, she come and she was wanting her daughter, um, you know, cat, the demon cast out. And then the Matthew account, Jesus said, you know, he, they tried to send her away. And he said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she says, because um, right, he said, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she says, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Kind of, I, I, when you talk about hunger, I just kind of thought about that passage mm -hmm. where she, you know, even the Gentiles were hungry right. for this salvation. And you know, I realize it's not the same as the, the righteousness, but I just kind of thought of that as far as those who hunger, you know, for that, you know, they're going to be satisfied. I think it's essentially, like you said, I think it's the same thing. Yes, I think it's a perfect example. Yeah, it, it really is. What it um, is, what it feels like. Well, and, and the Gentiles, they had been worshiping, not the Gentiles, the Samaritans had been worshiping God, mm -hmm. although from Mount Gerizim, and they didn't have the writings of the prophets because, you know, or the later prophets because they had, uh, Israel had fallen and into um, permanent captivity there. But still, they, they wanted salvation. And, and that's a good point about her craving for that. Any thoughts? All right, let's see. Just a little bit farther here. Turn over to 1 John. Let's look at where righteousness is found. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. Where is righteousness found? If you, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is what? Born of him. All right, now... There's the under, notice the phrase who practices righteousness. It's not simply wanting to be right with God, but wanting to live in a way that makes you right with God. Wants, putting you into that covenant relationship. Over in 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Here he says, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is what? Is righteous. Just as he is righteous. It's that simple. You know, if we practice righteousness, if we do what is right with God, 
then we are righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. Let's consider the contrast now. He who sins is of the devil. The devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The English Standard Version offers a little bit different rendering of this. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. And we would explain that in the context that an individual continues to sin without repenting, without trying to turn away. They just keep on going in it. And it's suggested that that's really maybe the better rendering of it. <clears throat> but he says there, there in verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin, does not continue sinning, does not go on practicing sin, for a seed remains in him. This is the one who's righteous. <clears throat> this is the one who's right with God. Okay, pardon me. Any thoughts or comments? That's the one who's also described in another place as one, one who puts on Christ. That's right. Puts on Christ. That's exactly right. Any it's, other not, it's not a coat that you put on and hang up in the closet, but it's something that becomes a part of your life. You put on Christ. That's right. That's exactly right. We have a, a comment here in the chat room, so let me jump over there to that. There we go. And this is from Randy. He says, the word of God in our heart makes us clean from righteousness and sin as long as we believe and obey. Now you think about that. The word of God in our heart makes us clean from wickedness and sin as long as we believe and obey and repent of our sins. As long as we turn away from it. Okay. All right. Any thoughts or any comments? All right. Let's see. We're almost now at the end of the first half of this study. Notice there the last thing on page 18 is to hunger and thirst after righteousness is to crave what is righteous, to long for righteousness, to greatly desire to be, as we said a while ago, right with God. All right, any thoughts or any comments? This is what we're looking at within this lesson. Blessed are, we'll do a brief review. Blessed are those, kind of going back to the beginning there real quick. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. They're impoverished, they're separated from God, and as a result, they mourn. They are sorrowful for that. They seek, they submit themselves in meekness before the Lord, and they hunger and thirst to be right with God. And each of these, the blessings, are as stated as such. Going back to the first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven, okay? And then, blessed are the mourn. Blessed are they, those who mourn, for they shall be what? Comforted. And think about that. You know, what would it take, and I didn't even cover that in the lesson. What would it take to comfort someone who is mourning because of their sin? Have it given forgiven. To have the sin forgiven, exactly. And to be accepted back with God. Blessed are the meek. What are they going to inherit? The earth. They're going, to, they're going to receive the inheritance. For all who does not, for all who are not meek, all who are not serving the Lord, there is no inheritance for them. And then the one last one we looked at, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. They will never be hungry again when you hunger after thirst, after uh, when you hunger and thirst after righteousness. All right. Any thoughts or any comments? Miss Pat or uh, Miss Phyllis. It's a little funny to inherit the earth when a lot of it's driving to heaven. Like, yeah. Do you want the earth? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I think um, that's why I, th I think the state the um, Psalms quote or where this is maybe quoted from Psalms that we looked at is important because it shows what the inheritance is really going to be for the remnant. If it was if they considered it physically, it would be the land once again, but the remnant ultimately is going to inherit eternal life with God in heaven. Yeah. But that's a, that's a good point. You know, why, why want to inherit the earth where there's barren spots and rocks and spiders and other things like that? Well, and it's, it's statements like that that causes, you, causes a lot of people problems and they want to say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. Right, right. Because it's going to be burned up, but here you're going to inherit it? Yeah. It says it doesn't... Yeah, that's true. Any thoughts, Gene? In all, in all of those desires, 
Not a, it's not a desire which is unanswered. That's right. It's a desire which is always answered. Right. And and each of those the and the each answer directly relates to the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Or what it is they do. Yeah. yeah. Basically, the sermon will about this eight characteristics of uh, blessed people and taking. In essence, they represent to us the principal graces of a Christian. Right. Yep. What it takes to... You think about Matthew chapter 6. We didn't read this a while ago. But not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father in heaven. He's painting for us the picture of here of those people who will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Of one who is one of his followers, yeah. All right. Any other thoughts? I right, appreciate all the participation and comments. We'll go ahead and end this morning. We'll continue our study of the blessed are statements found within the Sermon on the Mount uh, next week. The following week, you'll have the week off because we should still be in transit coming back from California. And the week after that, you'll have off as well because that's going to be the week of Thanksgiving. And then we'll resume week after that. So... There'll be a good break. I mean, a good little two-week break. We'll get the second part of this lesson done and then should be able to finish up the study on the other side of Turkey Day. All right. I think that's right. Yeah. Not we'll announce differently, but I think so. All right. Appreciate everyone coming out this morning. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Dale, would you mind leading us in that prayer? Our most loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and for the many blessings you've given us. We thank thee for the privilege we've had to be able to come together to encourage one another, to be able to study thy word, and we thank thee for John for his willingness to prepare and, and direct our minds in this study. We are thankful, Father, for your love and your patience with each one of us, for your son Jesus, who was willing to die upon the cross that we might have everlasting life if we'll be faithful to thee. We ask, Father, that you be with those of our members who have physical ailments, that they might be restored to a measure of health that they continue to serve thee and we ask that you would use us as instruments to reach out and help in any way that we can uh, that they know that they they are cared for and that uh, we want to help them in any way that we possibly can as we leave this place father we ask that you would be with us that we might not leave our christianity here but that we might always walk and talk in such a manner that others may see christ in us through our words and our actions these things we ask in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.